Okay, good morning. Let's get started. This is the third in the series of CS, uh, NETS's joint seminars. Next week's seminar is also a joint CS NETS seminar, and it will be presented by a visitor in the CS department here. The topic is um, uh, Internet of Things, and he's going to teach a course on that subject uh, next quarter, so it's a place where you can see if the subject is of interest to you. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Atile Ayilmaz from Ohio State University. He received his PhD uh, from University of <coughs> Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Then he was a postdoc at MIT for two years. And in 2007, he joined uh, Ohio State University. His research interests are uh, the fields of decision theory, uh, optimization theory, and network theory. And today, his talk is on an interesting topic of learning and optimization under uncertainty. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's great being here. Um, so this talk is about um, optimization essentially. So we, we deal with systems all the time in which we try to make decisions to optimize some metrics of interest. But here the emphasis is not singularly optimization but dealing with uh, systems whose statistics are unknown. Right? So there's random events happening in these systems and their statistics are to be learned in the process of optimization. Hence, we got to combine learning and optimization together. And the additional concept uh, I will emphasize is side information. What I mean by this is, or what this is motivated by, is decisions we make in these systems, and I'll give examples of that as I move on, uh, will, have, will give us information about other potential decisions. So the decisions, the outcomes we observe, has some information flow between them. So how do we utilize that to the advantage of this learning and optimization framework? So that's what it is, what this talk is about. Um, let me uh, preemptively apologize for any potential mishaps that could happen in this talk. It's a very recent presentation I just put together, basically, based on an active research what, that I'm excited about. So just wanted to share it with you. Um, and the other thing is, yes, Attila is really my name. Uh, some people hearing it don't believe it, but it's what it is. I live with it. <laughs> okay, so let me see if uh, it works. The outline is the following. I, I understand, you know, there's a mix of background in this audience, so I will. I, I try to structure it so I can give some basic information about the classical so-called multi-arm bandit. Problem. It's a very fundamental problem, has been around for decades, and very interesting advances has happened over it. One of which is this UCB style of upper confidence bound based algorithms uh, that give regret optimal solutions. I'll try to outline what this is for those who's not familiar with it. Then uh, there's a kind of a digression where I discuss an overview of several different works I've, and, you know, I've done with my colleagues and students uh, that have applications in social networks and communication networks. I'll try to discuss these and the common theme of these is that they use this inherent side information that I talked about. Um, but they come in very different styles and forms so we'll discuss kind of the differences uh, that one could uh, see. But this, uh, even if you're lost in this part of the talk, uh, don't worry, you can ignore it, forget it, and uh, when we come back to this new framework that's the most recent work, uh, is concerned with bandits over time, uh, where you can catch up again and then go on with the flow. So the first and the third bullets, I guess, are the main flow, and this in-between discussion is uh, kind of prior works we've been doing with a similar message. That's what I'm going to conclude. So, starting with the multi-arm bandit framework. So, let me ask first, uh, how many of you are already familiar with 
uh, multi arm bandits. Okay, no worries, great. So that gives me a good idea about, you know, I should explain it as clearly as possible. So the setting is as follows, very natural question one could ask. This is the classical form. You've got these uh, casino machines, K of them, each of which gives you some reward every time you pull the arm. And uh, that reward comes in a random variable, right? And that random variable is distributed with respect to some PDF, probability distribution, uh, that is unknown, okay? So every time we pull a given arm K, we keep on getting random rewards with the same distribution. Because that's unknown, we gotta work with it and try to find the best of these uh, machines. So the way it works is every, uh, starting from time zero, let's say, every time you make a decision, in this case, we have selected arm one to pull and received a reward for it. That random reward is observed, that's called a bandit feedback, hence the name bandit in the title. And then next time we have to decide what to pull with that information. So we make a next, next choice, in this case at time two we pick, pick the arm three uh, and we received a certain reward from it. And we keep on going this way. Every time we pull, there's a unit of time that's spent in that pull. So at the end of this, this whole sequence of process, at time number n, uh, we have those many pulls to make. And then we would like to make decisions based on the history on getting the most, most out of this process. So that means we would like to decide how to pull these arms in a way that our expected reward at the end of these n pulls is as large as possible. All right, so this is to be done without knowledge of these random variable r's. But we, we're gonna collect information as we pull. So there is this so-called exploration and exploitation trade-off that we have to optimize. So we have to explore the arms, get some information, and then exploit that knowledge to get the best out of the system. So this is the classical multi-arm bandit problem and this policy is what we need to design. Now, if we knew these random variable distributions, it's good to know what's the ideal uh, we're seeking. Uh, there is, uh, the best choice is very clear. We should always pull the arm which gives the best, the highest expected reward, right? So that arm, let's call that K star. So that will be the arm of interest. We want to design policies that gets to that arm more often. This mu is used for the expected value for the kth arm is unknown and to be learned. Now, that means our optimization, which I posed in the last slide, can also be posed in terms of uh, what we lose with respect to this best choice, okay? So this is the more natural way of writing this when you think of this as the regret you're gonna pay. So instead of maximizing the reward we'll get, we'll minimize what we would have gotten with the optimal choice minus what we are actually doing, getting, right? So because of the minus, this max becomes a min, and this part is a constant, basically, because if we knew everything, that's fixed uh, to the rate of the best R. So this is the called regret of a policy over a horizon of n steps. And this is what we want to minimize in the classical multi-arm bandit. Now, decades long, you know, effort has been made on this, very good advances made. Uh, this seminal works, only a few are listed here, uh, have developed bounds on this regret, what's the best you can achieve. Uh, by the way, this regret is always not negative because this is what you lose, so you always lose something with respect to the best choice. Uh, there's been lower bounds on, on how much you can lose the least for a large class of uh, approaches. And then there's been designs of specific policies. So one of this is UCD, I'll spend more time on that because I, I want to revisit it later. Uh, others are methods like so-called Thompson sampling. These use so-called Bayesian methods to come up with a solution. Um, there are some epsilon greedy methods. I don't have time to discuss all of these. But what they collectively said uh, is the main result is basically this, that the regret that you will get is theta, that's upper and lower bounded, with a scaling uh, that goes as this. So k minus one, k is the number of arms we are selecting. 
So k minus 1 times the logarithm of n. So minus 1 is because if you had one arm to pick, you don't lose anything. You always pick that arm, right? So there's really no choice to make, so you don't lose anything with respect to the optimal. But whenever you have more than one arm, you're going to have a scaling that's linearly growing with the number of arms times the, the budget you have about the number of pools you have uh, scales logarithmically. So this is the key point, that this growth in the regret as time evolves only grows logarithmically with the horizon that you're dealing with, which is a very slow growth, right? Logarithm is really some of the most extreme functions that takes large numbers to very small numbers. So in that sense, this is a promising, I think, a positive result that all, even though you don't know to start with the distributions, you can learn it fast enough so that your regret doesn't grow faster than logarithm in time. So that's the main reason. So within this class, uh, UCB is the main one that I want to focus on. Let me try to describe what it is and why essentially it works well. So what UCB does is for each arm, that each of the casino machines, K, uh, we uh, keep track of the times that it was pulled in the past. Okay, so this script T of K of N is the set of times that this arm is pulled out of the first N pools. So I can keep track of this as I proceed. In particular, the cardinality of this set, the number of times this pulled, is also called TK, which is without the script. <coughs> so what you can do is you can just look at the history of a particular arm, and you could make an estimate, a sample mean estimate, of the reward you have received from that arm. So what you do is all the times you have pulled that arm, you add up the rewards you have collected from it, and just take the average of that for the number of times you pulled. Right? That's a very sensible way of trying to estimate very intuitively what you would do probably when you pull the casino arms. So that seems like a good uh, metric to try to maximize. However, that's not the right metric itself to maximize. Um, what we need to do in the UCB algorithm is to select that arm which has the largest value of the estimate that it has received so far, the mean, mean sample estimate, plus a term that's a function of the time uh, that you have traversed so far. So at time n, what you try to pit, put, uh, pull, the arm that you want to pull, is the one that maximizes the average you received from that arm plus a factor, a term that I will try to explain more deeply. But that term is crucial. Okay, um, there's an the alpha parameter that's flexible here, so not a key point. So what this does is uh, concerned with a concentration bound. Okay, so this is about how well your estimate you had is with respect to the true value. Okay, so. This goes to way back to inequalities from probability theory. So assuming for this discussion uh, that the rewards that we're getting, although they're random, they're in a range from zero to some level, let's call it unity. Okay. These are the random rewards I'm getting. They come from this range. Then if that's the case, the average, the estimate that I collect from S of these samples, okay, S is some parameter, I will, uh, you know, free parameter. So out of the S samples of this random variable, if I take the sample average, the probability that that plus an epsilon being smaller than the true value, the true mean, uh, goes down exponentially fast. Okay. So those of you who have like a stronger probability background will see that this has to do with low of la strong law of large numbers. More than that, it has to do with large deviations. Okay, So it says that if you have collect sufficiently many samples and you take the average with respect to those many samples, your probability of deviating from the true mean goes down exponentially fast. So with each, each new sample, the epsilon deviation probability 
goes down exponentially. And that's a very fast drop. Right? So that inequality is actually at the center of this design because under the UCB operation, being the, setting this epsilon to this factor here, put it, put it in there, and then plugging that epsilon in the exponent, you end up with a probability that goes down at the rate of 1 over n to the alpha. Okay, so if this epsilon is selected such that it's in this exact form, we can say that the, the choice that we're making being more uh, or uh, being less than the actual true value goes down sufficiently fast. Sufficiently here is at the rate, at the polynomial rate. So this suggests that under this UCB policy, the probability of not selecting the best arm, K star, drops sufficiently rapidly with N, and hence it is a good choice. Okay, so I, what I want, to get, I want you to get from this is two things. The fact that UCB doesn't simply look at the sample mean. It has an additive term over it, and it's critical because without the additive term, what could happen is you could have, you could uh, by chance have very poor few samples in the beginning for an arm, okay? And it suggests the mean of that arm is very small. Although in reality, if you take more samples, you would actually find a better average, which is close to the true value. This additive term makes you go back and pull the arms that didn't get too much information yet. So that's the reason why uh, that extra term is crucial. Any questions? Okay, so let's see how, if you run this UCB policy on a four, four arm situation. So we got four machines. They have one or zero uh, rewards that are coming in. And the means of those go down from the first machine as the highest mean towards the last one, which has the smallest mean. So in this case, clearly, the first machine is the best, right? So if you knew these means, you would have selected the first machine all the time. Although you don't know it, so what you do instead is, over time, this curve, this, these dots show you which arm you have pulled over time. So what you observe here is the first arm, which, which is the best, is pulled very often, right? Much more densely. The others see decreasing rates of pulls because their rates that are rece received from them is smaller on average, you pull them still, but you don't pull them often because it causes you some regret, right? So in particular, uh, the reward that you collect, the total reward that you collect with this policy is deviating from the optimal, which is the green one here, by a a an amount that grows logarithmically with that. That comes from what I discussed before. And the number of pulls you make is going at the rate of order n for the best arm, but only logarithmically for the others. So the regret that you're getting from each of the others is adding logarithmically to the, to the regret. So that's what UCB does, and that's why it works well. The reason uh, I think I want to emphasize is this exponential uh, bound is critical to this discussion. <coughs> so I will have to uh, get back to it. Any questions? So this ends the UCB multi-arm banded framework and how UCB works. I have a question. Yes. I think you have it on your slide. Oh. Next slide. What, what are the applications? Sure. I mean, there, this is only a small set of applications. Uh, and there are variations to this framework. This was the classical basic setting. And people have evolved over it. Uh, but some of the applications is clinical trials. You got multiple, um, multiple uh, drugs to test the success of, and you need you have patients to give them to. So the resource is the patients, and and the res results that you get are the rewards from these different drugs. So how should you coordinate what drug to give the new incoming patient? That's one example. Um, you could any setting in which you have these different arms, the different things so as to generate random rewards that, are, that doesn't have information from the other. So when you give this to this patient, what happens 
is, doesn't give you any information about what happens to the other patient. So, I mean, these are the separated uh, independent observations. So that's where uh, applications uh, need to satisfy. That's the essential property. So this, this comes under the topic of stochastic bandits. There are so-called contextual bandits that has to do with recommendation systems. So these are situations where there's also a context to the uh, request that's coming to you. So you might know uh, whether the request has it to do with a video system or you know, an image uh, system and so on. So you've got some additional information concerning the context. Uh, and then there are other uh, situations of adversarial bandits in which these random things happening are not stochastic, they're adversarial. So they're doing the worst thing uh, against you. So you play against an adversary in this situation, so you've got to act differently in that case. So there's plenty of works around and beyond this theme. Uh, one of the things that I would like to emphasize here is some applications in which some basic assumptions don't hold. Okay? Concerning the size information especially. So uh, this gets us to the second bullet point, which I will try to go fast through. So there's information structures inherent to these decisions sometimes. They're not independent casino devices. And how to use that system information is concerning uh, some of the research we have done. So let's look at one example. So this is a situation, take the case of an artist recommendation in personalized radio. So if you are an individual, there's these devices giving you suggestions of the next song, right? And based on uh, that suggestion, you like or dislike it. So you give back an indication of a reward to the system. Uh, so it's multiple. Maybe it's based on the artist. Let's say the artist is the choice that's being made. And you give feedback with respect to that. So this is a situation you could run a multi-arm bandit over these different choices try to optimize it for each individual. But these individuals are living in a society, they're socially connected, and uh, likely that once these suggestions are made, uh, their friends can also be viewing what they watched. Okay, so there's this friendship network that can also observe <coughs> what different people have been uh, watching. So this is the social network. There's a graph underlying this. There's a lot of study about social network graphs. So in that case, what you would observe is not only your what's suggested to you, but also what your friends have looked at and ask you to like or dislike that as well. OK? So if a friend that's highly popular is recommended a movie or, or some song, uh, many of his or her friends will actually see what they watched and they will also indicate whether they would have liked that song as well. Right? This is more likely that social networks will, uh, friends will respond to this kind of uh, information. So, let's, if this is the situation, we have side observations. So this, within this graph, therefore, we get rewards for artist A, for the user I, if I suggest that artist to that user, but also get observations for the same artist from the neighbors of that user. I don't get a reward for it, because I didn't really recommend that song to them, but I get information about whether they would have liked it or not. Right? So this makes brings the question of, well, how should this graph information make an effect on who I suggest uh, new artists? Right? More popular people, perhaps, should receive more often uh, recommendations. So. How do we use that information has been the focus of some of the works we have done, which has gone over a you know, five-year horizon. I'll just give you some overview uh, contributions here. It turns out a linear program that we can formulate is at the center of the decision. And linear programs are nice. I mean, when you take things into a linear program, essentially you can solve it efficiently, right? So, that means we can actually formulate a linear program and use it as a lower bound on the regret. More than that, we can use the solution of this linear program, whatever it turns out to be, to develop a policy, in this case, an epsilon greedy policy, not directly UCB, but epsilon greedy, the other class. And then there's also a UCB modification we have uh, explored for the same setting. 
And the thing we have found out is the graph makes a big difference. And essentially, uh, the minimum dominating set size of the graph turns out to be a key factor in uh, getting the regrets lower. So I'll just leave it at that in the interest of time so I can move on to the next topic. So the next topic has to do with communication. In this case, we have a very simple wireless channel between a wireless tower and a mobile user. And there's a capacity to that link, which is fluctuating over time. And there's a feedback, which is a very simple 0, 1 feedback. So the nature of the capacity is there's some C of T that evolves over time that takes values from a set C1 to CK. So these are the K arms that we have, basically, in this case with an unknown distribution. So this capacity is fluctuating, and every time we make a decision, it's selected from this set with an unknown P. And then what we need to decide is the rate of transmission. right? If, if the rate of transmission turns out to be uh, larger than the capacity, we fail. Right? There's going to be a failure. We are sending at a higher rate than the system can support. Otherwise, we successfully receive the data and get the uh, success out of this transmission. So the one, its feedback, therefore, either says a failure, this rate was too high, or it says it's success. That's the only 0, 1 feedback that you receive from this system. What do you want to achieve? You want to maximize the expected throughput. So you need to learn in the process uh, what to get out of this system as best as you can. There is side information here because, well, if the rate we selected happens to be successful, we would have success for any rate smaller than that. Right? So the, therefore, I have the side information about smaller rate. If it's a failure, any rate greater than that would be a failure. Right? So there's this not so symmetric but asymmetric sort of side information we have inherent in the system. So how do we utilize it? So again, Quick uh, contributions here. Um, we, in this case, we developed the Thompson sampling method, which is a actually more sophisticated method to analyze, even though it has been around longer than the others. Um, so we, we were able to analyze that uh, under these two works, one of which is just recently, yesterday, accepted, basically. Uh, and the other is uh, we found lower and upper bounds on the regret performance for that policy, I mean, lower bound for general, but upper bound for that policy, uh, that, and showed that they are logarithmically growing, like the original uh, setting. And uh, we also considered lower complexity designs because Thompson sampling, as it turns out, is much more complex to implement in this kind of setup. So we have to look for no novel sampling methods that can make it work still. OK, so that's what it is concerning this one uh, channel. And there is another work we've done. Uh, this is a very uh, basic millimeter wave motivated channel, although it's not quite what you might, you might consider the sophisticated millimeter wave. But nevertheless, here's the setting. So I have this sender who is receiving packets randomly over time. These packets have deadlines, so they can't wait too long. So, um, and then I have many channels, in fact, potentially unbounded number of channels in a millimeter wave spectrum uh, that I can transmit this data over. Okay? So I can replicate, if I like, or encode them in sophisticated ways and send them over multiple channels. But these channels are on-off channels, line of sight, non-line of sight distinction of a millimeter wave. And every time I make a transmission over a channel, I consume an energy. So I don't want to overly consume energy. So I have to find the middle ground between getting the data through with low, low energy cost. And these channels have on-off uh, states that, are, that have an unknown mean. So and the assumption here, which is kind of essential, is these channels are statistically homogeneous. So even though they're different millimeter wave channels, I realize different states. Uh, they, they have a similar mean. So there's that information that's common to them. Again, what do we do in this case of how much to send, how many channels to decide to send over in order to get them through with, within the deadline, subject to the transmission cost. There's side information. 
because feedback carries information about other channels. And the other thing is, because these are deadline constrained, the number of channels I use is not a constant. It depends on how many packets are waiting. If there's a lot waiting and there have few slots to, to go, I need to probably send more uh, of them over the channel. So how do I make that decision? Very quick overview. Again, works, related works. We found the optimal characterization. We have developed UCB and Thompson sampling variations of algorithms. Found that we can actually achieve bounded regret in this case. Not, not even logarithmically growing. Um, and, and then uh, found that you know, there's significant uh, gains to be received from this side information we have inherent to the system. Okay, so that completes this digression. Now going back to the flow. So if you recall what we talked about concerning multi-arm bandit setting and the UCB design, you can try to recall that part and we can just continue from that onwards. This is the new setting, and uh, I hope to convey the need for this kind of setting from various applications. Primary one I'll discuss is what I call task scheduling, but I'll also discuss other applications of it. So this is a new work, and this is the, basically the student <coughs> who's working actively on this. Um, so motivation is that the time dimension in these multi-arm frameworks is not very well explored yet. Um, but real life problems have, have an element of time, which is usually also a randomness in this process. So for example, uh, or in particular, the actions we take before we get the reward, there's a time that is consumed and it's not a constant amount usually. And it could be even unbounded. You know, there might, there, it might take a very long time uh, to finish. So how do we bring these temporal dynamics into the framework? That's the motivation. So uh, let's go to the setting that we started with, but now change it uh, with this time concept in mind. So let's discuss this in the context of a task scheduling problem. So we call this non-clairvoyant task scheduling because the task sizes are the things we don't know when we start. So suppose there are these different tasks, I don't know, this could be machine learning tasks you might, you might want to run on a server, or you might try to be, you might be trying to optimize a parameter, so every time you run, you get, you take, it takes time to learn the outcome, and then you change it, and you keep on searching for it, right? So the setting is the following, I have this one server to uh, allocate, and I can choose task one, let's say, the time for that task one to end is itself random, and that's the main difference. So this x that I had previously was one, now is a random variable. And the reward is generated at the end of that process, because think of it as running a simulation. You run the simulation, and only at the end you see what the outcome is. Then you choose another task. You can go on choosing tasks, and they come with different times and different random rewards. It keeps on going this way. And your horizon is a finite time. So tau here is the new variable I'm introducing. Instead of previously I called n, uh, now this is time. So within this time, the number of pulls I make depends on the whole past, right? So I don't have a fixed number of choices or decisions that I can have. And this n pi of tau is that that random variable. It is the number of times under policy that I'm going to come up with that will lead me to those many pulls in the tau window that I have. Okay. So that's the essential setting where time is now a part of the decision process. Now n pi of tau is the number of completed tasks under the policy. I just discussed that. And now I have a similar maximization problem to solve, but now it's different because previously it was from 1 to n, which was a constant. Now it's from 1 to n pi of tau, which is a function of tau more than a function of n. Right? The time is what restricts me, so I have to make decisions with respect to the time horizon. So what, when you look at this, you might ask, well, what's my guess of the good choice? right? The first guess could be what we observed in the case of the previous setting, that we'll just choose the arm that gives me the, the or let me call it the task here. We'll, we'll just choose the task that will give me the highest reward. 
Is that a good choice? There is a time element that we're ignoring if we do that, right? So if this is not the best choice, because if we're getting reward at the expense of a huge time consumption, I can only pull that arm one or two times, a small number of times. So the number of times I pull the arm will be very few, so my collective reward will be small as well, right? So it's not enough to just look at the rewards, okay? The next thing you could say is, well, maybe it's the un per unit time reward. So I take the ratio of the reward over the time. So it's the per unit time, and I look at the mean of that. That's not also the optimal, as we will see. And a another one you can uh, guess is, which gets closer to the real but not quite, uh, is the mean of the reward that you get over the mean of the time that you consume. So this is also another measure of time per unit a reward per unit time. It doesn't also work on its own. Okay, so these are all some interesting things that, that came out as we explored this. And the other very important component in many applications is the time to complete a task is not uh, usually a finite or bounded time. Whenever especially there's a human involved in that process, human behavior is well known to have so-called heavy tails. So it takes a long time with a non-negligible probability. Because of that labor, these random variables we're dealing with can be heavy-tailed. So how do we accommodate all of that into this framework? So this motivates us to give this model of renewal processes, bandits over renewal processes with interrupts. So those familiar with stochastic processes will think, uh, will, will, will find it's very natural that th uh, this is modeled as a renewal process. So every time I pull a task, I start a task, the time it takes and the reward I receive as a pair is distributed with respect to some distribution P. Okay? That P is again unknown. Now we, we would want to learn that fast. So, but the other element is not only the renewal but also the interrupt element. Turns out interrupts are critical in this setting. So suppose I have a set of possible interrupt times. So I can start the process, and after a time I can say, okay, stop this, and I will restart something else. So uh, that's the set of times that we have available. <coughs> so if the inter-renewal time, that's the time that the task completes, ends before that interrupt time, in this case here, I do get the reward, whatever that random reward happens to be. But if my interrupt time comes before the time of the completion, I interrupt it and get no reward. Right? So this is a, a cost I have to pay if I happen to interrupt. The question is whether it's good to interrupt and in what conditions is it good to interrupt. And what we do receive in terms of this interrupted renewal processes is we receive a reward only if my, my interrupt is beyond the completion time. Uh, I receive the completion time as well, if that's the case. And, and I also know whether I was able to successfully complete or not. So I never know, if, if I don't complete it in time, I don't know the x and I don't know the r. All I know is just it's bigger than b and it's unknown what R is. So this kind of feedback is given back to us. For simplicity, I'll take the reward part to be unit. So every run will give me, if it's completed, will give me unit reward. I'll tell you how it generalizes. So this is sensible. It's trying to maximize the number of completed tasks in the time you have. This other assumption is concerning the inter-renewal times, the service time of a process. And this is a very weak assumption, saying that the mean of that, uh, um, not quite the mean, but the mean to the power, x to the power 1 plus gamma exists. And gamma could be as low as any number close to 0. So what it's essentially saying is that I want this completion time to have a finite mean and a slightly higher moment than that. It allows me to have infinite variance random times. 
Okay, second moment is not bounded here. So it could have very, very heavy tailed distributions. So this is what allows us to allow for heavy tailed distributions. All right, so what's the decision to be made? Every time I have to make a decision of what are what task to run and when to interrupt, or maybe not decide to interrupt at all. That's also a possibility. We know that n pi was the number of pulls we have made under our policy. And therefore, our decision is now translated to this. Our optimization is translated to this. So I want to maximize the reward collected, but that reward is only collected when it's completed. Right? So this indicator accounts for the fact that I can interrupt an ongoing process, in which case, because this is an indicator, it would be zero if this is not satisfied. We don't get the reward for that case. So this is now the original, you know, the more mo yeah, well-motivated problem to solve. The applications, project management is one. You run a different, you have different types of projects. You run one and put an interrupt. If it exceeds that, you stop. If you don't get any reward, you run a different type if you like. In this case, it's completed. You keep on going. If it's completed, you choose another interrupt time and a task and keep on going that way. So what do we do? Uh, in uh, situations like this. And the cost may not be only time, it could be a affine function of time as well, so that's an easy generalization. Another application is free trial strategy. So you're a company, uh, you want to maximize the number of subscriptions to make in a finite horizon. So how do you do it? Uh, by giving free users. So you, let's say, there's like how many days you need to select. So there's very different distributions that different classes of customers can have in subscribing. Students do it in a different way, maybe than faculty, which does differently from an industry person, and so on. So they have these very different properties. So the question there is, well, we have these different types, and we have time until they would subscribe if I start a free trial, and I get a reward if they su you know, successfully subscribe within the window. So how do we uh, interrupt and give free trial durations in order to maximize the number of subscriptions in, say, a year-long framework. So this fits into that kind of problem, too. So any like a situation where you have this kind of time element, this is a very a suitable uh, setting. So to, to solve it, we have to characterize the optimal policy first, even if we know the statistics. So in this case, it's not even trivial to solve the case where you know the statistics. It comes into a so-called stochastic knapsack problem, and uh, it's known to be NP-hard, although it will be, for us, we will have an approximation which is gonna work asymptotically optimally. So that class of policies we'll consider is static policies. So what it, the static policy is one in which you're choosing task K with an interrupt time B all the time. So let's take this policy as a potential good policy. So here comes some renewal theory. So under this kind of policy where you fix the task and the interrupt time for it, the reward that you will get grows linearly with time, okay, with a coefficient that's given by this ratio. This concerns the probability of the inter-renewal time being small enough for, for your interrupt time. And, and this, this uh, expression is the minimum of these two. So it's the expected value of the interrupt time and the service uh, time that you can observe. So this turns out to be what we need to optimize in terms of the K and the B. Call this reward rate, okay, RK of B. And we would want to find the best choice of K and B for this function. Okay. So again, going like re-expressing re this in another way is the reward grows linearly with that reward rate plus some term that's negligible uh, with respect to the linear time growth. So sh the question is, should I interrupt an ongoing cycle? So we, we found out various examples uh, in which uh, this R of B grows and decays as a function of the interrupt time. In this case, for example, if you don't interrupt at all, which means you're getting the infinite situation, 
the reward rate you're going to get is small with respect to what you could have gotten for an interrupted version of it. So this tells us that there is really significant gains that to be gained. Uh, this, this two times gain can be essentially infinite times gain for other distributions. Okay. Um, and these are all per unit time. So because of that, uh, interrupt time is critical. All right? So this is kind of uh, supporting our uh, need for interrupting. When is it critical is characterized by this inequality. So interrupting is optimal if and only if the reward distribution, this uh, inter-service time satisfy this inequality, which is saying that the residual time, so if you haven't finished by time B, the residual time needed to complete the task has a mean that's smaller than the unconditional uh, time that you would have started, you, you, you expect to get from the start. So if this holds, then you get uh, a finite interrupt time optimality. Distributions can be categorized all the way from a light-tailed to heavy-tailed on this horizon, some of which suggest no interrupt is best, and many of them uh, look for interrupts. Remember, this is at the boundary. Right, so that's what we have characterized first. Now, we have this optimal static policy, which chooses the best of these interrupt reward rates. And they, they are asymptotically optimal. So as time goes to infinity, they are as good, good as it gets. Now, um, I won't go into the reasoning for that. Now, the next thing we do is uh, we want to find them, right? So how do we choose the best of these without knowing the statistics? Okay. So the goal is to find the best choice. But there are challenges. The distribution is not only the mean. We're concerned with the whole distribution of x. There's partial feedback. And then we don't know at the beginning which type of distribution we're dealing with. It could be very different uh, rate to reward rates that we have to deal with. So, so we put these together. Um, and the key component in this is, I, I hope to express, I'll skip this part, it's not as essential, um, is the question of how to estimate a heavy-tailed x. So that turns out to be the key. First thing we looked into is the mean estimator. So just like we did before, we could just take the mean of what we observed so far and use it in order to estimate. It turns out it's very poor. The way it uh, goes down is only polynomial, so the concentration is not strong enough. So it doesn't apply well to heavy tail distributions. So instead, we looked at this median of means estimator. It's a very clever idea of what you do is you collect the samples, you group them into sets, you find the mean of all of the, each of these sets separately, and then, this is a, still a weak estimator, just like in the previous slide, but then you take the median of them. So you choose the, you order them and choose the middle of those, and that turns out to be strong together with the other one. So in that case, we could establish these high concentration results. So the key point here is that we can show that our estimator based on this with respect to the true value, okay, is still going down exponentially fast. That was the key to the UCB design. And with this estimator, you can actually get that kind of design, even for heavy tail X. All right, so I need to quickly, um, so there are two algorithms we developed for comparison. One of them is a naive one that doesn't use information from other observations. So that's like treating everything as it's, it's separate. And the other one uses information from previous observations. So if I have interrupted at BL and received success, that also can be used for higher interrupts and even lower interrupts. But failures only work one way. So again, we have this information structure embedded. We use that information structure in, your, in our update policy, so-called effective sample size. But the key is that there is side information we utilize. And the interrupt algorithm we use with that uh, additional samples is, um, is broken into two, type, two uh, stages. One is finding the interrupt time decision for each task, for each K, uh, UCB-like decision. And next, choosing that task which has the best rate plus a factor uh, or the best choice coming from the interrupt time. 
So we have this two-way optimization uh, that works uh, together. In terms of comparing the UCBN, not knowing side information, the UCBI, which uses side information, here's the comparison. So the regret we get under this naive policy grows linearly with K and L. K and L are discussed here, again, recalled here. That scales with logarithmically over time, plus additional K factor L. Our policy, in contrast, receives k minus 1 times log tau, no L. And L is the number of interrupts that we, we deal with, and additionally the same thing. So when you look at these two and compare their performance, what you see is first unbounded gains for a single task. So if I have a single task, the policy we designed doesn't even have any time increase. But if it's more than one task, you uh, the gains are order L. So the more interrupt times available to you, the more gain you're going to get from this design. Okay, so uh, we did, uh, there is uh, this discussion that I'll skip. I couldn't have finished, I didn't expect to finish this anyway. Numerical results um, shows what we have established theoretically. So this is for a single arm, logarithmic growth with respect to a bounded growth. Uh, and more arms, four arms, you've got these very different rates that we need to work with, and UCBI performs logarithmically but at a slower pace than UCBN, and that pace it even expands as the number of choices we have grows. So just like we saw as L increases, their, their separation also en enhances with it. So that finishes uh, this. There are generalizations I won't get into. Uh, this single one is not critical, is the main message here. Um, but uh, they can be generalized. Okay, so with that, I want to kind of reinforce the message of the whole talk. So leveraging side information in variety of different settings, in variety of different ways, I should say, no singular approach works uh, overall, uh, has, has significant benefits utilize this information you receive from other choices, you can actually imp improve the performance significantly in the learning process. And, and this new framework has been the central theme which we recently developed. So how time can be embedded into this you know, decision kind of uh, setting. And we kind of developed you know, these conditions for it and a design that actually uh, receives a significant benefit. So that finishes the talk. Thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker.